so I want to tell you briefly three uh, stories, uh, people I personally know and what happened to them, they were so-called active um, public dissidents in Soviet Estonia. First, man with dark glasses is my uh, good friend from Tartu, uh, Johnny B. Isotam, Estonian best beat poet. He was uh, arrested uh, age 17, 1956, because he was founding, founding and uh, organizing a national um, schoolboy uh, organization, which was considered by Soviets as uh, anti-Soviet. Uh, he spent uh, almost eight years in prison, and, uh, and when he came back to Tartu, he never could work as an intellectual who he was but only as a uh, fireman, not firefighter, but a man who, who shovels coal in, in central heating system. So this was his work 30, almost 30 years after prison. When Estonia became independent, again, he became a most uh, valued editor of academic uh, human, human humanistic science magazine, Academia, and, and he helped even edit um, my, my um, doctorship work. He, he has amazing knowledge. So uh, another story, Yuri Kuk in the middle, he became a real martyr symbol of Estonian resistance. He was born 1940, he became chemistry professor of Tartu University, and um, was so good in, in his science that he uh, got possibility in 1975 to go to work in France one year as an exchange between Soviet Union and, and France scientists. And it, this trip opened his eyes. He was a member of Communist Party and he became back. He wanted to quit Communist Party. It wasn't possible. He was fired from work, thrown out of everything, and uh, he joined dissident movement, started to actively um, fight uh, for Estonian freedom, writing, uh, signing several uh, letters, and he was arrested in 1980 and uh, sent to uh, Russia to uh, prison, and he was uh, murdered a year later in prison because he started a hunger strike and he was uh, forced to feed, like forced feeding, like they did for prisoners, and he died from this. So he became our uh, murdered prisoner, only one actually if we don't count those hundreds uh, and thousands who died in Siberia, 1940s. So, uh, briefly, economic um, resistance was in many forms of sabotage. Mostly, we said that uh, they, Soviets, pretend to pay us salary and we pretend to work. This is shortly the case. And then cultural resistance, um, uh, I belong to this generation of literary critics because we couldn't write openly about our society, so it all became hidden in literature, in poems, between lines, and there was, was a whole uh, strong generation of critics who started to write about this literature in the language that everybody could understand, but not Actually, you couldn't say that it was anti-Soviet, but it was this kind of double writing, double thinking between lines. For example, one of my, my best articles uh, from this period was the art of not saying anything in, in our poems, you know, because it, it became, it really somehow uh, pushed up our poetry, which, which was in very high level. So the most uh, famous case where I was deeply involved, and you have the letter of 40 intellectuals in September 1980, why it was different and why we uh, who did it didn't get arrested. This was the first case when openly uh, criticizing analytical uh, text uh, letter um, uh, did reach 
all Estonian people. It was never published in Estonia, uh, but it was published in whole Western world, um, uh, New York Times, the Time magazine, and, and uh, many European uh, leading uh, letters later. Despite it was sent to the Pravda, the Communist Party main newspaper, and uh, it was sent to Estonian uh, main Communist Party newspaper. Uh, what we did differently from those dissidents I told you was that we decided to protest against uh, uh, this Russification and cultural pressure and violence. Uh, there was a uh, certain um, cultural event, rock concert of young people, after which uh, they started to shout loudly, uh, hundreds of schoolboys, uh, against Russification. There was just a named uh, educational minister who didn't speak Estonian at all uh, against this, uh, some slogans. So, uh, Polizia, uh, which was called Militia in, in uh, Estonia, uh, Soviet Estonia uh, beat it up and arrested hundreds of schoolboys in many Estonian cities. And this was the actual uh, act why we decided intellectuals to, to write some letter to have some open dialogue with Soviet powers about the situation in the country. The uh, result was, of course, that we didn't get punished immediately. Political punishment uh, started slowly during one to two years. But people took this letter, multiplied it uh, themselves. Many people get caught and got punished for multiplying this letter. I was once uh, driving a, a cab and cab driver offered 25 rubles, do you want to buy this letter? Which was written by my kitchen table from a group of intellectuals. And, and we offered to sign this letter to be collective and not them to give a possibility to arrest all Estonian writers or composers or leading scientists at once. This was the main idea that let's write as many as big names as we could. We offered the possibility to sign to this letter about 100 people during one month, September 1980, uh, and only 40 was, had encouraged enough um, to sign it. There were many reasons why people didn't sign. Uh, some were afraid, some were uh, thinking that it was too mild text, that we need more uh, stronger actions, etc. But the result was that only 40% uh, really wrote it. Uh, this was a very important moment in my life because I got fired from a quite high position of uh, chief editor, position of academic magazine uh, language and, uh, and uh, literature, uh, magazine of Academy of Science of Estonia. And I became a uh, jobless dissident for uh, almost eight years. And um, KGB started to follow our home life about two years. Uh, cars were sitting by our doors. And um, we were followed mm, in many, many uh, different ways. Even our seven-year-old child was questioned and Teachers in at school were questions about our activities, and um, I discovered myself in our landline phone a little uh, red uh, pad, uh, which was listening device, and um, everybody who visited us was followed. Uh, we had many, many foreign friends, tourists who visited us, etc. I uh, tried to publish. Um, my, my articles and poems, uh, but couldn't publish anything uh, during uh, like four or five years. Um, uh, I wrote many, under many pseudonyms, and I remember how uh, even one chief editor of Literary Magazine was fired because uh, Central Committee of um, Communist Party discovered that uh, he had published my articles because of uh, by, by under pseudonyms. I was um, pressured to join the Soviet Army uh, 
Soviet Union started Afghanistan war, war 1980 and they uh, really pressured me to go to join to medical service. Uh, as you know, in Soviet Union, all higher education uh, women were uh, forced to have so-called army education uh, in medical service. And uh, so I, I studied four years, despite I was philologist, I was forced to study medical things. It was quite useful, actually. <laughs> but uh, but uh, because my son was seven years old, uh, just going to school, I, I managed. Uh, my husband was also a first husband. Uh, father of my son was fired, and we didn't have much income several years. But uh, beekeeper uncle helped me. and and some other people. Results of the letter, uh, actually history books nowadays write that uh, this letter really uh, helped Estonians culturally. It slowed much down all this Russification um, uh, process and in some cases even stopped it. Uh, what did I do during those jobless times? I wrote four books, couldn't publish them. I wrote a monography, biography about poet Kirsty Merilas, couldn't publish it. One reason was that Russification program forbade publishing in Estonian, and, and this was my un second unpublished dissertation. First one was in 1970s uh, in sociology, because this study um, uh, of cultural newspaper was uh, also forbidden to publish, and I was forced uh, to sign that I, I will never publish those data what I got in my study. So, uh, so 1980s, uh, I started underground, we started with my husband, uh, very active underground work um, uh, in the form of handmail contacts with uh, foreign Estonian politi politicians in Finland, Sweden, in USA, in, and actually in many other European, East European countries also. The main thing what we did, we just uh, collected and uh, secretly sent out information about the uh, real situation uh, of the Soviet Union. That's what uh, did those dissidents earlier years. But uh, because of this uh, traveling between Finland and Estonia made it possible to do uh, much, more, much more effectively. What methods did we, we use, we use in, in this work? Um, it was mainly letters, photos, microfilms, books, because there was absolutely forbidden to send out uh, any newspapers even from Soviet Union. Uh, only this Pravda level uh, newspapers you could send abroad. But no local newspapers, they were afraid of information out and afraid of information in. Some uh, methods what we used to send out and bring in information were, for example, my, my, in my personal experience, we used baby carriages, boxes of musical instruments, cosmetics, even in cream uh, bottles. Uh, you use condom, put some microfilm in it, put in cream pot, and it goes well. Souvenir packages, uh, chocolate boxes. I had a friend, um, a World War II veteran, who had a wooden leg. It was empty, so you could use it. Then, of course, the usual stuff you know from spy movies, like shoes and jelly jars and and leather notebook. I I uh, show you. This was my most famous case. We microfilmed. Uh, secret classification program from 1978. This is not the same leather cover. It was a little notebook between like souvenir, which was handmade leather souvenir from Tallinn. It was very popular in those days in Estonia. And I, I, we microfilmed this uh, most secret document of Communist Party in Estonia and sent it to Finland, a Finnish contact person sent it to Swedish journalist. It was uh, read publicly in Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and then published all over the 